So there are reports that Obama wants to take the ego off the great seal of the United States. Remember, this was controversial in his campaign. He redesigned the great seal to put himself on it. Remember that? And his airplane. But now, sobered by the realities of actually having to govern, Obama will remove the ego from the great seal of the United States and replace it with a predator drone. Uh, and this image of the predator drone, I think, is very... Very full of meaning. A drone, of course, the people who parasitize others and don't do any work. Think of the uh, interesting opening scenes of Verdi's immortal opera, Attila, about Attila the Hun, of course, where uh, Attila clashes with the Roman general Aetio, Aetius, and uh, the, famous, uh, the famous aria by Attila when he says, Vanitosi. Abietti dormenti tenete del mondo la posa. So you egocentric, self-centered characters, abject and lazy, you exercise power over the world. You have world power. Uh, a bad scene. Um, and the idea is that we're in the low empire, where this is the last days of Pompeii, more or less. The question is the empire will not last. But will the underlying nation state last? I say, yes, it should. And that is, uh, that is more than enough to take care of every reasonable need. And again, as Ataturk told the Turks, as de Gaulle told the French, as Sakharov told the Russians, empire is bad for you. If you don't want unemployment, reactionary politics, dumping of uh, commodities, uh, wretched conditions of life, and endless wars, and never-ending casualty lists, and despair then get rid of empire. Empire doesn't work. Not, however, to make space for some new empire. No, <laughs> not any great power coming out of Asia or any place else. Against empire under any and all conditions, uh, in the spirit of Plato, Machiavelli, and Leibniz. So now, we're told in this, um, this study, let's get the exact reference on the study, because this, of course, has set off a whole round of things. Uh, Sean Gregory, British uh, professor, the article is entitled, Terrorist Tactics in Pakistan Threaten Nuclear we Weapons Safety. This is in the CTC Sentinel, the Combating Terrorism Sentinel, Combating Terrorism Center Sentinel, West Point, the issue being dated June 1st, 2011. And what does he say? The vulnerabilities of the Pakistan nuclear forces increased because there are now a hundred of them, uh, intended primarily to offset India's conventional military advantage. The open-ended escalation of Pakistan's nuclear weapons production explains why Pakistan has led opposition to the International Fissile Material Cutoff Treaty, FMCT, a treaty which would cap fissile material stockpiles. That's great for the existing imperialists, but naturally it will not fly. Critics point to a number of vulnerabilities that place the Pakistani assurances about the safety of their nuclear forces in doubt, writes the British professor for the West Point uh, study. These vulnerabilities boil down to three core concerns. A, the physical security of nuclear weapons across the entire uh, nuclear cycle may not be robust enough to withstand a determined terrorist assault. goes into the attack at that Faisal Air Force Base in Karachi uh, and so forth, uh, as well as the attack on the Pakistani Army headquarters two years ago. B, that about 70,000 people will have access to the nuclear weapons cycle at some point, and some may be willing to collude in various ways with terrorists. And C, the threat extends beyond terrorists gaining access to complete and viable nuclear weapons and includes the immense political and security implications of terrorists gaining access to fissile material, nuclear weapons components, or penetrating nuclear weapons facilities. And his uh, basic scenario is, suppose you have the successful location and penetration of a Pakistani nuclear site by terrorists, even if they were ultimately unsuccessful in accessing nuclear assets. This would be by itself a transformative event, both in terms of the U.S.-Pakistani nuclear relation and in terms of international anxiety 
about the security of Pakistan's nuclear weapons. So uh, lots of press accounts uh, rehashing that in various forms with various quotations. Again, uh, the easy pretext, a strike against Zawahiri could then turn into such an attack. The Pakistan government on June 9th asked President Ahmadinejad of Iran for the specifics. What specific intel does he have that there's going to be a U.S. attack on the, uh, the Pakistani nuclear forces? And this is all over various uh, newspapers and, and so forth. Uh, now, there are a lot, there's lots of friction. Uh, we are told that uh, the, the Pakistani government has been kicking out various CIA representatives, the people that were the spies and informants, supposedly, uh, in the uh, a- anti-Bin Laden operation of May 1st. They have been arrested as uh, op-ed columnist here, even in the Washington Post today, the most anti-Pakistani paper. Uh, David Ignatius, the establishment, right, CIA, State Department, mouthpiece, he says, it, it's not surprising that Pakistan arrested people suspected as CIA informants on the Osama bin Laden raid and other operations. Working with a foreign intelligence service, even a friendly one with good motives, so supposedly, is a no-no in any country, asked Jonathan Pollard. Yeah. So any anybody working for a foreign intelligence agency is going to have some, uh, some grief. Um, the Pakistanis are... Uh, apparently blockading uh, food and water shipments into one of the drone bases. They want the drones, drone attacks to stop. But various writers, including the same Ignatius, say, well, the Pakistanis com- complain about these drone attacks, but they cannot and will not stop predator missions that originate in Afghanistan. Well, <laughs> Maybe yes and maybe no. I mean, there would be ways to stop such predator drone attacks, such as attacking the bases from which they are uh, conducted, and that could be done uh, through irregular forces. So this is an an insane uh, escalation. Now, in the middle of all of it, we have a great chill of fear going through the U.S. foreign uh, policy establishment, and it starts with the New York Times on June 15th. Pakistan's chief of army fights to keep his job, and this is about General Kayani, General Ashfaq Parvez Kayani, who has been the head of the Pakistani military since 2007, and here's what the New York Times writes about him. General Kayani, who has led the army since 2007, faces such intense discontent over what is seen as his cozy relationship with the United States, that a colonel's coup, a colonel's coup, while unlikely, was not out of the question, said a well-informed Pakistani who has seen the general in recent weeks, as well as an American military official involved with Pakistan for many years. So two sources say there may be a coup d'etat brewing against Kayani. Uh, Interesting discussion of this also found in the National Review, the reactionary to neocon uh, organ, and this is by uh, Stanley Kurtz, who uh, tried to fight Obama but has now gone back to the usual neocon stuff. So um, yesterday, June 15th, the Washington Post and the New York Times both talk about the tremendous anti-Americanism in uh, in Pakistan, this is simply resentment for, for, for insults and, and attacks and, uh, and perfidy. I don't understand this uh, holier-than-thou hypocritical double standard applied by these observers. Of course, I do. But uh, there it is. So um, he's worried. He says, these two articles are disturbing. The New York Times account is more disturbing because it raises the prospect of an anti-American colonel's coup against Kayani. So he goes through. What will this mean? Uh, The Pakistan army is forcing American operations out of the country. They have blocked the supply of food and water to the drone base. Uh, And there are there are now these uh, more attacks on the uh, tank trucks on the Karachi, the Khyber supply line. And uh, he gets to the point of saying uh, the outcome of a break could be war. Yeah, war. We had this here about a month ago here, um, Dr. Kurtz. We'll be back in a minute.